Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Michael Watkins, and I'm one of the pediatric epileptologists here at the McGovern Medical School, uh, University of Texas Health Science Center in Houston. Uh, today, I'm going to be presenting an introduction to magnetoencephalography, uh, which includes the role of MEG in epilepsy. First of all, I have nothing to disclose. Uh, to begin our talk, uh, I'm going to start with just a kind of general flowchart to show a typical workup for intractable epilepsy. Uh, we believe you've spoken previously or listened to other lectures on intractable epilepsy, but uh, just a quick rundown. Uh, we define intractable epilepsy as uh, any epilepsy where the patient has been treated with two or more medications that are adequately dosed and appropriately chosen uh, for the patient's specific type of epilepsy, and yet they still continue to have seizures. Uh, so if that's the case and you're diagnosed with intractable epilepsy, our initial workup typically is going to include video EEG, MRI, the brain, and neuropsych testing. And the goal of this initial evaluation is to try to determine whether your epilepsy is localization related or considered uh, more generalized. So if we determine that, the, that your epilepsy at this point is more generalized, typically focal surgical options are not uh, going to be uh, used at that point. And so we're going to consider more along the lines of vagal nerve stimulator, ketogenic diet, or modified Atkins diet, or perhaps even a corpus callosotomy, uh, depending on the type of epilepsy. Uh, if this initial workup does show uh, that the epilepsy is localization related, meaning that it all comes primarily uh, from one location, then we typically will progress with other studies such as magnetoencephalography, PET, or even SPECT. Um, the goal of these additional studies is to try to determine uh, is your epilepsy considered lesional, uh, meaning that we can see an abnormality or there's a detectable abnormality on neuroimaging? And is the, the data that we've obtained, including EEG, MRI, MEG, PET spec, all of these things concordant, meaning they all point to relatively the same area of involvement where all of the epilepsy activity is coming from relatively the same location? Uh, if that's the case, then we'll typically proceed or at least advise either lesionectomy uh, to remove a specific area of the brain or uh, cortical resection as well, which uh, is uh, considered focal epilepsy surgery. If this initial workup is, determines that your epilepsy is more non-lesional or the data does not all point to the same area, or perhaps it's lesional, but near an area of the brain that performs a vital function, uh, sometimes at that point, we'll have to proceed with more EEG, invasive EEG evaluations, such as stereo EEG or uh, grid placement. And we'll talk about those things a little bit more shortly. Uh, hopefully through that evaluation with invasive EEG, we would be able to determine whether or not to proceed with surgical resection, or uh, perhaps the, the, we still are not able to localize a specific area, then we can still uh, kind of fall back with vagal nerve stimulation, ketogenic diet, modified Atkins diet, uh, or even um, CBD oil in some cases. So for this specific talk, we're going to focus more on magnetoencephalography or MEG. So to start off, MEG and how does it work? Uh, so MEG is considered a functional neuroimaging modality where it evaluates cerebral activity by recording the magnetic fields produced by electrical currents in the brain. So if you see this picture here uh, with this gentleman's head, if you look, you can see the, the most of our uh, tools for epilepsy are, are typically considered to monitor the electrical activity, the abnormal electrical signals produced by the brain. What the MEG does, if you see here, this red kind of arrow is meant to represent the direction of the abnormal electrical activity or the electrical activity in question. And then you can see here, this blue kind of circle represents the magnetic field that circles around that electrical activity. So if you think back to you know, high school physics, any electrical activity is going to produce a magnetic field. And so we use what we call the right hand rule, which I can try to show you on camera. But using your right hand, if your thumb represents the direction of the electrical activity, then your fingers are going to represent the orientation or the direction of the magnetic field that circles around that electrical activity. So instead of measuring the electrical activity itself, the MEG is instead going to be measuring the magnetic field produced by that electrical activity. So another question is, how exactly does it do that? So 
Obviously that gets into a very specific physics, but in general here, again, you can see the direction of the electrical activity. You see the magnetic field circling around that electrical activity. And then this is just a graphical, graphical representation of how the MEG is going to record or uh, that magnetic field. So it uses what we call squid. So these are superconducting quantum interference devices. So these magnetic fields are measured using an array of these sensitive magnetometers to measure the magnetic field, and we call those squids. So if you look here, you can see this coil, which is going to basically detect that magnetic field, and that is included within the squid sensors. And this is, again, representing kind of the patient's scalp. Here you can see the direction of the electrical activity, the magnetic field that circles around that electrical activity being detected uh, by the squids. And then this is just the representation of the patient themselves within the scanner. So uh, when you think about these magnetic fields, you can see synchronized neuronal currents are going to produce a weak magnetic field, which is significantly smaller than the magnetic field in the surrounding environment. So cell phones, computers, anything electronic is going to produce a magnetic field that's much, much larger than the ones produced by the brain. So the way we record these magnetic fields despite this is to use a magnetically shielded room. Uh, and here in the picture, you can see this is actually our MEG at our institution. And so you can see the magnetically shielded room, the giant door, and you can see the, the bed. Uh, this is on the inside of the room. You can see the table and then where your head is placed within the scanner. So MEG, if you consider or, or uh, general advantages uh, compared to other uh, monitoring tools, we have MEG is the only modality that can provide real-time neurophysiologic data that's considered complementary to EEG. It's not necessarily better than EEG. EEG is not necessarily better than MEG, but we use the two together uh, to help localize abnormal electrical activity and determine seizure onset uh, for patients with intractable epilepsy. Um, so these signals from the MEG are measured directly from the intercellular neuronal activity. It's considered completely non-invasive. Uh, this MEG can be performed during sleep, typically without sedation. Uh, the short test duration, the epilepsy portion of the testing takes about one hour. And then we also do sensory or uh, language mapping, which can take an additional 20 minutes or, or longer, depending on how many sensory modalities are, are mapped as well. Uh, and another aspect is that it, the MEG is considered appropriate for patients of all ages, including babies. And typically, the signals are not affected, at least not much, by patient movement. We have uh, motion correction software that can take movement into account and still obtain uh, good results, even in children and babies that tend to move a little more. Um, other advantages, uh, magnetic fields in general are considered minimally effective by uh, the skull, and so we're able to detect those magnetic fields uh, well with a little signal attenuation or distortion. Uh, the MEG is also uh, able to detect a slightly smaller amount of substrate. So when you see these numbers, uh, this is representing the amount of brain tissue, basically of abnormal electrical signal that's necessary uh, to be detected by the MEG. So the MEG only needs 3.5 uh, square centimeters, whereas an EEG needs more in the realm of six to 20 square centimeters, which depends on the location and research study as to which number uh, you use. Uh, MEG also has more sensors utilized for data acquisition, so around 300 sensors versus the EEG with 21. Uh, and then also, as we said, overall improved spatial resolution um, and source localization accuracy. So the MEG can, is typically considered accurate up to three millimeters, whereas EEG is around seven to eight millimeters, which also, again, determined, is determined by the individual study. Uh, another comparison between MEG and EEG, this gets a little bit more complex, but uh, bear with me. Um, so scalp EEG is considered more sensitive to vertical or radial sources, better or more so than tangential sources. So if you look here, this is an example of a vertical um, source, a vertical dipole. So on this picture, you can see the direction of the electrical activity kind of perpendicular to the scalp. Uh, and here you can imagine if there was an electrical, an EEG electrode, it would pick up that electrical signal very well. Whereas the same electrical signal, this direction, you can see the magnetic field around it. The squids around the scalp detecting that magnetic field would not detect it quite as well. And so here you can see these vertical dipoles, the directional, the uh, electrical activity that travels in this direction is 
typically better seen by EEG. Um, here you can see MEG is, a, is sensitive to tangential sources. Uh, and so if you look at this tangential source here, this is the electrical activity is traveling in the opposite direction, more parallel to the scalp surface. Uh, so you can imagine if there's an EEG electrode here, it's not going to pick up the signal quite as well. Whereas here with the same directional source, you can see the magnetic field circling around a squib located above this field uh, would, would typically detect that magnetic field very well. So um, just to reiterate, EEG is typically better at radial versus tangential sources, and MEG is typically better at tangential compared to radial sources. Uh, this is another example of kind of how the MEG and the EEG work together. So this is a 2005 study from epilepsy uh, where 43 patients were evaluated uh, to determine their inter uh, spike discharges, and they were evaluated using both EEG and MEG. So 31 patients, spikes were detected with EEG and MEG, whereas eight of those patients, spikes were detected only with MEG alone. Uh, and then one of those patients, the spikes were detected only on EEG. Um, so you can see the advantage comes uh, from using both uh, EEG and MEG together. Uh, so this is just kind of an example of how we read uh, MEG. So, on our screen, this is the EEG section here. And so we would typically be looking for spikes. Here's an example of the MEG portion of our screen. And here we're also looking for spikes. Um, and so as you can see here, the spikes are not quite as clear on the EEG. However, on the MEG, you can typically, at least for this example, pick up a pretty clear spike. And when you put the two together, this, which is typically how we view um, our analysis screens, you can see using this data uh, together, and these are time locked, so we're looking basically at the same time. Um, this is all the EEG channels, and then these represent a section of the MEG sensors, which we can change uh, to, to give different views depending on which sensors we isolate. Uh, so this is kind of a simulated MEG analysis. This, this is how it works. Um, we're looking, we basically we find a spike, and then you highlight kind of that area in question. Here you can see a good MEG spike and good correlate on the EEG section as well. So then uh, we're able to view this individual spike in this all channels display looking at all of the MEG channels. And here you can see it over this kind of left posterior area is primarily where a uh, majority of the spike activity is located. So here we look for basically the spike that has typically the earliest onset, the highest amplitude, uh, that looks the most significant. And then we're able to basically click on and focus on that individual spike. And so here we map the onset, the peak of that spike, and we're able to visualize the magnetic field. Um, so here again, we have the, the direction of the electrical activity with our thumb, and then you have the uh, direction of the magnetic fields here, blue representing in at red out, you can see the circle, the, the orientation of the magnetic field kind of circling around that electrical activity. And then uh, one of the most interesting parts of the MEG is we're actually able to take that uh, MEG signal and uh, we call the dipole and we're able to fit that or estimate on the patient's own MRI uh, the origin of that activity. And so here you can see, uh, again, MRI, you have to remember it's, it is reverse. So left is on the right, right is on the left. So we're looking from basically underneath the patient. Um, and you can see that again, it's, it's kind of in this left kind of posterior area as we see here. Uh, and this is basically what one of the report screens would look like with the left parietal uh, MEG spike. Uh, here's just another example, left parietal MEG spike. Uh, so in some cases, uh, once the, would we determine that these, uh, this abnormal electrical activity has relatively similar spike kind of morphology, we're able, and location, we can average these together to get even better results, a higher signal, the lower noise kind of interference ratio, we're able to get an even better localization of uh, estimate of where that electrical activity uh, originates in the brain. And so this is a, a view of all kind of different planes of the patient's MRI. Uh, we didn't talk about this earlier, but this red square is representing somatosensory. So we basically blow air puffs onto the patient's index finger uh, and then locate or, or use the MEG uh, kind of spikes provoked by or produced by that stimulation to localize um, their sensory areas of the brain. And then the yellow triangles are representing the abnormal electrical activity or the spikes uh, that we uh, that I showed you earlier. 
And so again, this is just a different orientation, the same kind of left parietal spike. And then again, this is what we call the axial. So again, another orientation here. Again, you can see the somatosensory, the sensory areas of the brain, and then the yellow triangle as uh, the uh, abnormal electrical activity or the spike. And here you can see what we always hope for on the MEG, which is a cluster of spikes, all in relatively the same location, all with what we call that dipole orientation, all pointing in the same or a similar direction. And then here you can actually see the blue represents the average, the yellow triangles again represent the individual spikes. And so again, here just in different um, planes, different orientations, you can see really nice cluster, all electrical activity traveling in relatively the same direction. Uh, so this information is used um, to basically help us localize the abnormal electrical activity uh, even you know, more accurately used in, in combination with the EEG and the MRI and all the other tools that we mentioned earlier uh, to help determine um, kind of the best course of action moving forward as our patient a surgical candidate. And if so, kind of where do we suspect or, or do we or think that the interictal or the, the seizure onset zone uh, is located. And so as we said, this is kind of the general role of MEG and epilepsy is lateralization uh, and localization of the epileptogenic zone, the area of the brain that produces uh, the, the seizure activity. Um, MEG helps to determine surgical candidacy as we discussed as it goes along with that intractable epilepsy workup um, to help determine you know, whether or not uh, individuals epilepsy is more focal and are a better candidate for surgical resection. Um, we can also use it, as we mentioned, for functional localization, which is what we mentioned, the, the sensory information with finger pumps. We can do language as well. Uh, and so we can try to localize the functional areas of the brain and determine where they're located in relation to uh, the seizure focus. And then MEG, then pro by providing all of this information, uh, it's considered uh, critical for to the neurosurgeon for subsequent uh, surgical planning. So just to go over some examples of how the MEG can be used, we're gonna talk about some uh, brief clinical cases. Um, so our first patient is patient PH. Uh, so uh, PH had seizure onset at 10 months of age, uh, typically seizures with fever, which were described as right-sided clonic seizures with uh, secondary generalization. Um, no AED started initially. However, she then later had a similar seizure uh, without fever at 15 months of age. And then subsequently also had a prolonged seizure requiring intubation uh, status epilepticus episode at 18 months of age, at which time she was started on anti-seizure medication. Uh, she then at 18 months also had onset of more complex partial or focal seizures uh, that were characterized by behavioral arrest, head turning to the right, uh, about 20 to 30 seconds in duration, uh, and then several of these uh, occurring per day. And then of note, she also had normal language and motor development initially until about 18 months of age, uh, and then subsequently had regression uh, with only one to two words noted at three years of age. So her initial evaluation, she had genetic and metabolic testing, which revealed a, a genetic mutation of unknown clinical significance. Um, her MRI of the brain was determined to be non-lesional or normal, meaning there was no specific uh, location seen on the MRI that was thought to produce or be responsible uh, for her seizure activity. Um, we did scalp EEG monitoring, and so interictal discharges, meaning between seizures. Uh, so we looked for spikes uh, independently of seizures, and she was actually noted to have frequent left temporal spikes, uh, as well as left occipital in the back uh, spike and wave discharges also. Um, interestingly, for this patient, the ictal activity, which is the seizure onset, uh, showed um, during her seizure, she had behavioral arrest and unresponsiveness, and then head turning either to the right or the left. Uh, and on EEG, on EEG during the seizure, she was actually noted to have right-sided uh, rhythmic activity over in the right temporal area, and then spreading to the right occipital area, and then bilateral uh, posterior area. Uh, this patient also had a PET scan, which showed looks at uh, metabolism. And so with a PET scan, we're looking for areas of lower, typically of lower metabolism, uh, which helps you to uh, determine uh, possibly a seizure onset area uh, identified by the lower area of metabolism. And so for this patient, um, the PET scan showed significantly decreased metabolic activity in the left occipital lobe and left temporal lobe. So 
with this patient, we were able to see spikes on the left. The PET showed decreased metabolic activity on the left occipital and temporal lobe. Uh, but however, her seizure onset was thought to, at least on the EEG, the scalp EEG, uh, to be originating from the right temporal and occipital lobes. Uh, so this patient underwent an MEG, uh, and during the MEG, again, you can see here, MEG spike, EEG uh, changes as well. And then again, looking at the magnetic field, the, the direction of the electrical activity, and then here you can see the uh, MEG, the, the spike localized to the patient's uh, MRI. And so here again, kind of left parietal. Uh, again, you can see here, left parietal occipital discharge, uh, kind of similar location. And then here is the, uh, the view of the patient's MRI in different orientations. Again, you can see a, real, a much larger cluster here than what we saw with our example earlier, um, but still kind of over in the left, you can see kind of posterior quadrant. Uh, so after this MEG, obviously the MEG also was more suggestive of left posterior along with the scalp EEG and the PET scan. Uh, and so she was determined at this point uh, that further intracranial EEG evaluation was necessary. Uh, and so this patient underwent subdural grid placement. And you can see here, this is just a graphical representation, the left side of the patient's brain uh, with different grids, um, EEG electrodes implanted uh, surgically um, for invasive EEG monitoring. And this is just a kind of a mesial view. And then this is inferior view from basically underneath. So uh, during this intracranial EEG monitoring, we were able to capture numerous typical clinical seizures and electrographic seizures. And as the MEG um, and the interictal data showed, seizure onset was noted to arise uh, from kind of within this lateral temporal occipital grid into the, uh, from the lower corner, as well as uh, over the anterior, the mesial anterior and kind of subtemporal electrode. So basically in this kind of left posterior quadrant area. Uh, so with seizure onset identified um, to that region, the patient then underwent a, what we call a parietal occipital temporal resection. Um, and uh, typically during these uh, epilepsy surgeries, we'll do what we call uh, electrocorticography or ECOG, which is we, we basically monitor, we place electrodes on the surface of the brain during surgery, both before and after surgery. Uh, the idea being, you know, before surgery, we, we monitor, um, looking for spikes. And then after the surgery, we do ECOG again, uh, placing electrodes on uh, the surface of the brain around the area of resection uh, to ensure that that spikes, uh, that no more spikes, no more uh, discharges are seen. Uh, and so this patient, uh, particularly after her uh, occipital, uh, parietal temporal occipital resection, uh, no spikes were noted on the, uh, on the ECOG after surgical resection. Uh, and then we always we send uh, samples to pathology for evaluation, which showed widespread cortical dysplasia, uh, which is just abnormally formed tissue, which is uh, typically common, uh, commonly produces uh, abnormal electrical signals uh, that can result in seizures. Uh, so this is an MRI uh, for this particular patient. You can see the white area here represents uh, the area of resection. So you can see a relatively large uh, resection area in this left kind of posterior quadrant and temporal area. So following her surgery, uh, no motor seizures since surgical resection, uh, occasional brief staring spells only. And then uh, this patient also had improved interactivity, um, was more interactive, so substantial uh, progress with speech therapy and motor coordination. So in this case, uh, MEG advantages included the fact that the MEG could confirm spike lateralization uh, to the left when the EEG was considered falsely lateralizing and the MRI uh, did not reveal a specific uh, lesion. Uh, and then in this case also, the, the MEG guided uh, intracranial electrode placement uh, to further evaluate the seizure onset zone and determine borders uh, for possible surgical uh, resection. Uh, so one more case, uh, this is patient VR. Uh, so patient VR had seizure onset at six years of age, uh, which she described as an initial strange sensation uh, followed by generalized tonic-clonic activity, usually around one minute uh, in duration. So after this initial activity, she was started on Keppra. However, she continued to have uh, one to two uh, seizures per week for several months. Uh, and then later at age seven, uh, she began to have focal seizures, 
that she described of kind of this aura of seeing clowns or skeletons and then what had this initial kind of left mouth and eye twitching uh, and then what had left head deviation bilateral uh, arm tonic extension and then the, kind of that typical figure four posturing and then she would have uh, generalization afterward um, despite multiple anti-seizure medicines uh, the patient at this point was continuing with seizures on an almost hourly basis uh, initially, her mother, her parents had reported normal development. However, at this point, she was in the first grade uh, and was obviously had very poor school performance, as you can imagine, with uh, the frequency of, of seizures. Uh, so her initial genetic metabolic testing was found to be normal or negative, uh, and she had an MRI brain uh, as well, which the initial read uh, was determined to be non-lesional, again, with uh, no specific um, structural abnormalities noted. Uh, so EEG monitoring uh, for this patient, uh, we looked again for interictal data, meaning spikes. Um, and so she had uh, focal uh, sharpened wave uh, discharges, spikes over the right temporal parietal region. Um, so kind of over in this area, uh, as well as some slowing over that same um, kind of right kind of posterior area. Uh, and then during her seizure activity, uh, she was noted to have uh, onset over again the right kind of parietal occipital right posterior quadrant uh, and so she also underwent an MEG so here again you can see MEG spike and EEG activity um, looking at on the all channels display we can kind of see this spike as as being kind of the highest amplitude and, and earliest and so with analyzing um, uh, this peak here again is the magnetic field the direction of the electrical activity uh, the magnetic field in that direction, circling in that direction. Uh, and then here is the localization of that activity on the patient's MRI. And you can see kind of in this right kind of parietal towards the middle area. Um, this is an average of 140 of those spikes, again, in that same similar location. Uh, here you can see again, the uh, various views, various planes of the patient's MRI with uh, the MEG activity. The, the yellow triangles, again, these are the average MEG spikes. Here you can see, again, the sensory information uh, from the finger with the air puffs, and then the yellow triangles, again, are the MEG uh, spikes representing the abnormal electrical activity. So interestingly enough, for this patient, uh, we went back and looked at the MRI knowing that this was the area of interest suspected for seizure onset. Uh, and we're able to see that uh, perhaps there actually was more of kind of the abnormal tissue um, in this area. However, um, given all this information, it was determined that a uh, patient needed additional um, intracranial evaluation, again, just to define uh, the specific uh, seizure onset area, as well as the borders of the epileptogenic area. Uh, and so this patient actually underwent stereo EEG electrode placement. Um, so stereo EEG electrodes are uh, basically implanted um, into the brain through burr holes uh, that are drilled by the neurosurgeon. And then we're able to monitor uh, intracranially again, uh, just a different way uh, from the grids we discussed previously. Uh, so using this evaluation, again, uh, we were able to identify spikes um, over the right parietal area. And then seizure onsets were noted to, to come through the contacts, which we named LESA and LESB through the areas of the MRI um, that were thought to be abnormal, as well as the areas identified by the uh, MEG spikes. Uh, and that was noted to be the primary uh, seizure onset zone. Uh, so this patient underwent uh, surgical resection again with EEG electrocorticography prior to surgery, which showed frequent discharges over that planned um, resection area that was localized by MEG at stereo EEG. Uh, she then underwent right parietal resection uh, of this, um, this area, and then postoperatively, again, with uh, EEG electrocorticography on the surface of the brain, showed resolution of those discharges with no spikes around the uh, area of resection. And again, pathology results indicated, again, cortical dysplasia, which was the abnormal uh, brain tissue that's typically considered uh, common with uh, seizures. So outcome for this patient uh, was, says she's been seizure free since her original surgery, now back in school doing well with significant improvement. And here you can see it was just a very small uh, resection area.
know, for this kind of right parietal region. So uh, for this case specifically, uh, MEG advantages, uh, you can uh, remember the MEG can confirm the spike localization when the MRI is considered non-lesional and the EEG at least appears uh, to involve a regional area. Uh, and in some cases, such as ours, this MEG can prompt MRI kind of reevaluation and possibly reveal previously undetected uh, abnormalities um, of the brain tissue itself. Uh, MEG, again, can show this functional localization of somatosensory uh, or motor cortex kind of in relation to the epilepsy or the, the, the seizure onset zone. And then uh, MEG can also guide intracranial stereo EEG electrode placement again, when we need further definition of the borders um, for surgical resection. Um, so just overall, the role of MEG in epilepsy, as we discussed, it's very important uh, for lateralization and localization of the epileptogenic zone. Um, it can help to determine uh, surgical candidacy for patients who with intractable epilepsy. Uh, it's helpful with functional localization uh, to identify these functional brain areas and, and locate where they are in relation to the seizure focus. Uh, it also provides critical information uh, for surgical planning. So that's all we have uh, for today for our quick introduction to MEG talk. And thanks for all of our, to all of our wonderful MEG or to our epilepsy team. And thank you very much for your attention.